Good afternoon and welcome to the Narrow Path radio broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg and we are live for an hour each weekday afternoon beginning right now, 2 o'clock, going till 3 o'clock. Monday through Friday we have an open phone line for you if you have questions about the Bible. Uh, By the way, I said 2 to 3. Of course, that's on the Pacific time zone. Some of you are listening in very different time zones than that. But uh, the same time every day in any case as you're listening right now. Uh, The... Uh, phone number if you'd like to call in with any questions you have about the Bible or the Christian faith or to disagree with the host on any subject, feel free. The number to call is 844-484-5737. That's 844-484-5737. Our calls, uh, there's some calls waiting, but there are some lines open, so give me a call and you can get through. Uh, Don from Snohomish, Washington, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hi, Steve. It's a pleasure to speak with you. I met you in a private home when you were up in Seattle a few months ago. So oh, pleasure to, to, to you hear then. your voice again. Thank you. My question is regarding Malachi 4, chapter, chapter verses 1, 5, and 6. Uh-huh. May I read them real quickly? or? Sure, feel free. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. And then skipping to verse 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse." So I have two questions. When is that great great and dreadful day of the Lord, and what is that curse? Okay. Uh, well, the, uh, I understand the great and dead, dreadful day of the Lord to be the time, as he says, where he brings the curse upon the land. Now, the version that you read and that I have in front of me both say, uh, thus I strike the earth with a curse. The word earth there is the Hebrew word eretz, which is also the word for land. So if you see the word Eretz, it's either earth or land, depending on context. And every time you find the word earth or land in the Old Testament, it's the Hebrew word Eretz. So it's it's kind of a word that can go either way, depending on context. This, I think, is referring not to striking the earth with a curse, but the land, that is the land of Israel, with a curse, because God had threatened to do that. Uh, He said in Deuteronomy chapter 28, If you do not keep all of my commandments and my covenant, my statutes and so forth, then I will curse you and I'll bring all these curses upon you. And uh, from Deuteronomy 28, 15 on to the end of the chapter, he enumerates the elements of this curse that would come upon them if they continually violate his covenant. And they, they did. And this curse, I think, did come upon them in the form of the destruction of the temple, the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of the Jewish nation in AD 70. And, uh, and of course, that temple has never been rebuilt. That's almost 2,000 years later. That curse was the one threatened by God at the very beginning when he made the covenant with them. And he's saying, listen, I'll have to do this if you don't turn around. So I'm going to send Elijah the prophet to turn you around. Now, Jesus said, if you can receive it, John the Baptist is Elijah who was to come, which means that Jesus understood this passage to be fulfilled in John the Baptist coming. And that would make an awful lot of sense because of what Malachi is talking about in general from chapter 3 on. Uh, Notice in chapter 3, verse 1, he says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Now, that verse is quoted in the New Testament numerous times and applied to Mm -hmm. John the Baptist. Uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think every gospel quotes this verse and applies it to John the Baptist. So, This is talking about John coming. And then it says, in uh, later in the same verse, Malachi 3, 1, says, And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, in whom you delight. Behold, he's coming, says the Lord of hosts, but who can endure the day of his coming? For he shall, and who can stand when he appears? For he's like a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap, and so forth. It goes on. Talks about Jesus coming after John the Baptist has come. And... Uh, coming to the temple in a refining fire uh, and and one that very few people apparently will be able to survive. Who will endure it? Who will stand at this time? And so I believe that Malachi is 
is prophesying about the era which we read about beginning in the third chapter of Matthew. John the Baptist comes and he preaches that the fire is near. The fire that God is bringing on the nation is near. Remember, he said that Jesus is, uh, the, the axe is already laid to the root of the trees and every tree that does not produce fruits cut down and thrown into the fire. He says that Jesus is coming with a winnowing fan in his hand to separate between the wheat and the chaff. And the chaff, he says, will be burned with unquenchable fire. This is in Matthew 3. It's also found in Luke 3, where John the Baptist preaching is paralleled. So we see John the Baptist is preaching that this time has come, that God is about ready to bring this fiery judgment on the apostate nation. But he's sent John and he's sending Christ to draw from the nation first the remnant who are faithful so that they will not perish with the rest of the nation. And we see that in Malachi chapter 3, uh, verse 16 and 17, because it says, in, uh, Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. That would be the faithful remnant in Israel. He says in verse 17, They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make them my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. And this is, of course, what happened. The faithful remnant in Israel who heeded John the Baptist and then heeded Jesus, and they became Christians, they escaped from that Holocaust that occurred in 70 AD. They left, the, they left Jerusalem before the Romans got there. And therefore, God, it's like he describes it in Malachi like a man's house is on fire, but he grabs his valuables before he gets out. He, he spares his jewels. He spares his, his, the things that are precious to him. And, uh, and he gets them out so they don't succumb to the fire. And that's what God did when he was bringing this judgment on Israel. He first rescued his own people who were like gems to him. And uh, they did escape. The, the Jewish church, the Jerusalem church, did escape and fled to a place called Pella on the east side of Jordan. And that's what I think he's referring to. The great and dreadful day of the Lord, therefore is a reference to A.D. 70. And, and there's another prophet that used very similar language to speak of the same thing, and that was Joel. And in Joel chapter 2, verse 28, it says, It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Also on my men servants, my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon into blood before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. But whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Notice he talks about the great and terrible day of the Lord there too. And he says that he's going to pour out his spirit just prior to that on all flesh. And then there will be this judgment of this terrible day of the Lord. Well, that did happen. The Spirit was poured out at Pentecost, and Peter quoted this passage in its entirety as being in the process of fulfillment. The Spirit was poured out, and very soon thereafter, there would be the terrible day of the Lord. But whoever would call on the name of the Lord would be saved. So we see this as a theme in the, in the prophets, that God was going to send the Messiah. He'd, he'd send the, John the Baptist first. Uh, Isaiah also spoke about this in Isaiah chapter 40. Uh, he'd send the Messiah. He'd send the Holy Spirit. He'd gather his elect, and then he'd bring judgment on the apostate nation. That's what Malachi is talking about. And that's what Joel is talking about, too. And both of those use the, the term the der terrible day of the Lord. All right. I, I buy that answer. As I, I've kind of shared that, and people don't seem to like it when I share more or less what you just said. Well, I think, I think there's a, a, lot of, a lot of popular teaching says that the great and terrible day of the Lord is either the tribulation or the judgment of the last day when Jesus comes back. Uh, and therefore, they're looking for Elijah the prophet to come in the future. But Jesus said to his disciples, if you can receive it, John is Elijah who was to come. And uh, when the disciples on another occasion said, why do the scribes say Elijah has to come first? Jesus said, Elijah has come first. You know, Elijah has come. So, you know, he's referring to Malachi. There's no other Old Testament prediction that, that Elijah would come. The only prediction that the Jews had to cause them to expect Elijah was Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. And so Jesus and the disciples are referring to that passage. And she said, it's already happened. If you can receive it, that's John is the guy that's talked about there. 
And so we see that John the Baptist is mentioned both in Malachi chapter 3 and in Malachi 4. And this is said to come just prior to God bringing the great and dreadful day of the Lord, or the fire, upon Israel and upon the temple. So is there a, another coming of, a, of the spirit of Elijah and a great and dreadful day of the Lord? Uh, not mentioned or is that this all passage, been fulfilled? No. As far as I as far as I can tell, there's no there's none more. If Jesus said it was fulfilled, uh, and then and no further prediction of it was made, then I would not look for an additional fulfillment. Okay, thank you, Steve. Okay, God bless you, Don. Good talking to you. All right, our next caller is Cheryl from Everett, Washington. Cheryl, welcome to the Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Uh, hi, Steve. Thanks. I've got a question. I just finished listening to your eschatology series. Uh -huh. And you mentioned toward the end of the last lecture that God's waiting for the church to mature. Yeah. And since the true church is mixed in with the um, people that are attending churches and that, mm -hmm. if we're all supposed to be working together, I was wondering what type of signs would we see to know to work with others and find other true members to work with them? And I'll take your answer on the air. Okay. Uh, thank Thanks. you. Now, when I say that, uh, people often say, well, you know, is, does anything else have to happen before Jesus comes back? And I say, I don't really know of anything specific, except that the Bible does say he's waiting for the church to mature. Now, I don't know how, you know, how, what degree of maturity or what that will look like. I mean, I don't know that we'll really know when that happens. God, God is the one who has to know because he's the one who's been waiting these 2000 years. And he's the one who will wait until he's got what he's waiting for. And then he'll come. And, uh, you know, Jesus put it this way in, in Mark chapter 4. He said, the kingdom of God is like if a man sowed seeds and he slept and he woke and the seed grew of itself. Uh, the ground itself produced grain, first the blade, then the head, and then the ripe grain in the head. And then he says, and when the grain in the head is ripe, then he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. So the harvest doesn't come until the grain is ripe, and that is mature. Uh, Jesus was a grain of wheat. He said if a grain of wheat doesn't die, it, it doesn't. if it doesn't fall on the ground and die, then it, it remains alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. That is more grain. And so the kingdom of God, uh, beginning, frankly, with Jesus' death himself and his resurrection, began to produce grain. That is more like Jesus, more, more wheat kernels, each of us. And we are... Uh, we are produced in clusters, that is, in fellowships, uh, like in heads of grain, like, a, like an ear of corn has all these little individual grains in it. But when an, when an ear appears on the stalk, uh, the grain in it isn't ripe. You can't eat the corn at that point, or wheat, if it's a head of wheat, which is more like what Jesus had in mind, I'm sure. Uh, you have to wait for it to ripen. The green grain isn't really of any use. You don't harvest green grain. You harvest mature, a ripe grain. That's what Jesus said. He said, when the grain is ripe, then he puts in the, the sickle because the harvest has come. Jesus, uh, Paul put it this way in Ephesians 4. He said that God has given the church apostles and prophets, and evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the mystery, uh, for the edifying of the body of Christ until we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a mature man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So that's what he's waiting for. That's what the church, uh, that's what these ministries in the church are given for, to bring us to a maturity, which only God will really know when that has come to the degree he's waiting for, because we can't, none of us can step out and step back and look at the whole body of Christ on the, in, on, on the planet and say, oh, I, I can see now we're all mature. Because as you said in your question, the way you frame the question is quite correct, the true Christians are all intermixed. In, within the institutional churches along with uh, people who aren't really Christians. And therefore, if you look at the institutional churches, you can't tell how mature the real church is. The real church is made up of people who are following Jesus. The institutional churches, are, at best, have only some people in them who are following Jesus. The rest are, who knows what they're there for, but they're not following Jesus. And that's why institu institutional churches seem so carnal <clears throat> and seem so immature and seem so worldly, uh, because they're intermixed with Christians and non-Christians. But the true church that Jesus sees, when God looks on the earth and sees his own, he sees those who are truly in the community of Christ. 
Some of them are in the institutional churches. Some of them are not. But he knows who they are, and he knows how they're maturing. He knows the degree to which they have reached or not reached the, the goal he has for them. And so it is possible, even though we can look at the modern church, if we mean the institutional church, we say, wow, we're very, very far from unity. We're very, very far from maturity. But that's only because we're seeing an institution that's got Christians and non-Christians. The true church doesn't. The true church only has believers, only has real followers of Christ. Now, when you find those, I have found, at least when I meet people who are really following Jesus, uh, there's obviously, as Jesus said, the, the mark of a real disciple is love. And if you love the brethren uh, and you're aiming at loving as Christ loved, then you're making advances in that direction. And, and, and frankly, I think the true church is, is advancing along just fine. The only problem is there's an awful lot of things calling themselves church that aren't. But uh, you're wondering, how would we see? How would we know? I don't know that we will. We're still perhaps prone to look for signs of how near we are to the coming of Christ. I don't think the Bible ever urges us to do so. I remember hearing a, uh, a preacher on the radio many years ago saying, you know, Jesus told us to look for the signs of the times. And I thought, did he? Where does he say that? And he didn't say it. Jesus never told us to look for the signs of the times. The only time the term signs of the times is found in Scripture is when Jesus was rebuking the Pharisees. And he was telling them that they were hypocrites because they could, um, what do you say, they, they could predict what the weather would be like the next day, but they couldn't discern the t- signs of the times. That's the only time you find the expression signs of the times in the scripture. It's in Luke. Or no, it's in Matthew, I think it is. In any case, it's only once. And he's not talking about the sign of the end times. He's talking about the signs of the times they were living in. There's no reference in the Bible to the signs of the end times. The expression is never found in Scripture, nor are we ever encouraged to look for signs. He just said we should be ready because we don't know when the Master comes. He says the Master is going to come at a time when you're not looking for him, when you don't think. That's when he'll show up. So the Scripture does not indicate that we're going to have some kind of advance notice. Hey, he's coming. Uh, we're supposed to just be like a person who knows a thief could come at any time, and we're always going to be ready for him. We're going to be found employed in his service when he comes. Remember, Jesus talked about the servant who says, oh, my master delays his coming, and he goes out and he compromises. He begins to eat and drink with the drunken and beat his fellow servants, and the master comes at a time he doesn't look for him uh, because no one knows when Jesus is going to come back. And he said to his servants, a time that you do not think, that's when he's going to come back. So God knows how far along the project is and how much further it needs to go before he ends it. Um, And as far as I know, God could come, could could end it today. Jesus could come back today, uh, as far as I know. But then I don't know. Maybe there is more that he's waiting to accomplish. I suspect that may be the case, but obviously only God really knows. Okay, let's talk to uh, Greg from Eugene, Oregon. Greg, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hey, Steve. You know, I wanted to say that I really appreciate you sticking with the Max. That's that's why. You know, I, I want to I, say I uh, to the studio, once in a while when I hit this line, this happens to be line number one, there's no one there, even though there is someone there. Hello? So I wonder if we've got a problem with that phone, with that particular line on the switchboard. Something to look Hello? into, because uh, it seems like almost every day I say so-and-so, and then they're not there. Uh, Greg, are you there? Steve? Hi, Greg. Is, yeah. is that you? Okay, I yes, guess we have okay. to get the, vol- right. we, we we the volume up. Sorry, go ahead. I, want, I wanted to tell you that I really appreciate you, the facts that, that's been helping me with my research and, and understanding of the, the scriptures. Thank One you. of the problems, of course, uh, called numerous signs about is in, I, I prefer the NASB, and I've got NIV and a couple others, and my first Bible was the King James back in 79 for my mom. But... Yeah. Um, in the NASB, what I'm seeing is anti and pro Trinitarian doctrine, and so I've been trying to figure this out: is why are both uh, one of them's wrong? I'm, I'm guessing, but uh, the um, from what I understand about <coughs> the Trinitarian or the um, pro uh, Nicene Council ruling um, or manuscripts is that the the King James is the only Bible that's 
solely defined by those, not the um, <coughs> the uh, end of the um, the older manuscripts, the Aryan manuscripts. So, Greg, so, what is your question for me? There, there's some strange noise in the background there. Do you know what that noise is? Chimes. I guess so. It's it's very high pitched and a little little annoying. Oh. But what is your question Sorry. for me? What is your okay. question? Okay. Um, so, is uh, about the um, the difference in the manuscripts. Um, what was the 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 um, uh, the the manuscripts that the Nassim Council issued to replace the old manuscripts um, had upper and lower case, and that's how they defined when they uh, the difference so that they wouldn't be confused when they destroyed all the older manuscripts. So, what was that called? I'm not familiar with what you're talking about. I'm not familiar with the Nicene uh, Council destroying manuscripts or producing a new manuscript. The Nicene Council was actually not convened in order to come up with new manuscripts of the Bible, but to discuss a theological controversy, which all the manuscripts uh, agreed on. That is to say, the those who had a case against the Trinity could could make their case from any of the manuscripts. And those had a case for the Trinity could make the case from any measure. That's still true today. Um, I'm not sure what uh, I'm not sure what where you're getting the information, but I've, well, I've the, never. I mean, I've studied the, church history, but I don't know everything that happened. But I had never, of all the times well, the I've next, ever read about the council, I never heard about them doing these things. The next group of manuscripts, um, the uh, the first the older manuscripts um, were the Alexandrian text, which is all uppercase. The next grouping of manuscripts um, that most of our Bible is produced from is um, because those there's like a thousand of those and only 30 of the others, the Alexandrian, but they have upper and lower case. And the reason the church did that was to define the difference between the two. Yeah, this is something you brought up before, and I've, I've tried to correct you. Most of our Bibles are not based on the later manuscripts. The King James Version is. And the New King James Version is. But most of our Bibles are not. If you look at the NASB, the ESV, the Holman Christian Standard Bible, the uh, uh, the RSV, uh, the ESV, you name it, any of our modern Bibles, the N, uh, NLT, any of these modern Bible translations, they all use the Alexandrian text, which are the older older manuscripts. So, I mean, you often say, you know, most of our Bibles are following what what you consider to be inferior texts from a later time after the Nicene Council. Now, I don't really know that the Nicene Council was ever involved in a in anything quite so sinister as trying to eliminate any of the old manuscripts. I don't think that was ever consciously done. Uh, the differences between the Alexandrian text, which is the older one, and some of the later manuscripts, the differences are the kinds of differences that are that someone would normally uh, introduce accidentally in the process of copying, accidentally leaving out a word, uh, but not consistently doing so, or maybe uh, adding a word uh, to clarify, but maybe they shouldn't have. But the point is, I don't care which manuscripts you use. And uh, every time you call, you want to make a big dish issue of these, and you want to and you want to basically say that Trinity is somehow based on bad manuscripts. What I'm saying to you is, you use the New American Standard Bible if you do. That's the Alexandrian text. They use the Alexandrian text, and they are strong Trinitarians. That is the Lockman Foundation that put out the New American Standard Bible. They're Trinitarians. They, they believe it teaches the Trinity, and so do I. And, but if you use a Bible based on the later manuscripts, you still got the same passages. The only, one that's, the only passage related to the Trinity that's significantly different in the manuscripts, and you've brought it up several times in your calls, is 1 John 5, 7 which the, old, the, the older manuscripts don't have it, and the newer manuscripts do. But since most of our Bibles use the older manuscripts, most of our Bibles don't have that verse in them. And, that's, and, and therefore, Trinitarians, which is virtually all mainstream Christians, uh, no matter what Bible they use, they're going to find the same support for the Trinity. Uh, so... I actually don't know, Greg, where where your knowledge of church history is coming from. I'm not saying you don't have some truth there. Maybe you do. I've never heard any expert in church history ever say that the the Nicene Council destroyed older versions of the Bible and came up with their own version. I've I've never heard that suggested. And uh, while I haven't read everything that's happened in church history, I am, you know, I've read 
a dozen books about the whole history of the church, at least, and I've never seen anyone suggest that that happened. So I'm not sure if you're getting your information from the Internet or, or from somewhere else, but it kind of sounds conspiratorial. And I'm not saying there never have been conspiracies, but I don't know that there was such a conspiracy with reference to the text of Scripture. Certainly, I, I would seriously doubt that there was one, you know, that the Nicene Council perpetrated. Anyway, I need to take a break here, and we're going to come back and take more calls. Greg, I appreciate your call. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we have a half hour ahead of us, so don't go away. We just take a break at the bottom of the hour to let you know that the narrow path is a listener-supported ministry. Uh, we pay for the time on the radio station. It's very expensive. We don't pay for anything else. There's no, no, uh, no payroll here. No one gets paid. There's no overhead. There's no offices. Uh, there's nothing. There's no, no expenses here except that we pay for the time on the radio. If you'd like to help us pay for the time on the radio, that's what keeps us on, you can write to The Narrow Path, P.O. Box 1730, Temecula, California, 92593. You can also donate, if you wish, from the website, which is thenarrowpath.com. Please stay tuned for 30 seconds, and we'll be back for another half hour of your calls. The book of Hebrews tells us, do not forget to do good and to share with others. So let's all do good and share the narrow path with Steve Gregg with family and friends. When the show is over today, tell one and all to go to thenarrowpath.com where they can study, learn, and enjoy with free topical audio teachings, blog articles, verse-by-verse teachings, and archives of all the Narrow Path radio shows. And be sure to tell them to tune into the show right here on the radio. Share listener-supported The Narrow Path with Steve Gregg. Share and do good. Welcome back to the Narrow Path Radio Broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg, and we are live for another half hour taking your calls. If you have questions about the Bible or the Christian faith or a different view from the host, feel free to give me a call at this number, 844-484-5737. That's 844-484-5737. Our next caller is Art calling from Manhattan. Art, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hi, Steve. Uh, thank you for taking my call. I value your opinion, and I'd like to get your point of view on the topic and if it's related or if there's anything in the Bible um, that states uh, anything if, if, uh, in reference to this question. I know of, it, uh, I knew of an individual who uh, was studying the Bible. Um, they, they tried their best. They were not into drugs or alcohol. They ended up getting um, into falling into poverty, homelessness, and they ended up committing suicide. My question to you is, what is your opinion on, you know, first off, I, from my understanding, I'm guessing the Lord then banishes the person perhaps to hell because of the suicide. But my question to you is, for me praying for this individual, <clears throat> um, is, is there anything that you can, I don't know, is it like petitioning the Lord? Like if the person's in hell and if the Lord already sent the person to hell, if we pray for this person's soul, you know, does the Lord then be like take notice, for instance, to say, okay, well, you know, these people are praying for this individual despite the fact that he was you know, banished into hell for his actions? Well, I would not take it for granted that he's been banished into hell. Uh, there are many Christians who believe that whoever dies uh, without without faith in Christ is automatically and immediately sent to hell when they die. This is a very controversial because there's nothing in the Bible that says that this is true of all sinners. The closest thing you have is the story of Lazarus and the rich man, where uh, a rich man, when he died, w went to Hades. And Hades is sometimes translated hell, though I think poorly. That's not a good translation for it in English. But, uh, but if the rich man went into Hades and he was tormented in flames, if that is indeed what happens to everybody who dies without knowing Jesus, uh, then I guess one could argue that he's there. But many people feel that that particular parable is not describing things necessarily as they are because Jesus in the parable is not trying to make a point about the state of the dead, but about something entirely different. And some people think he sets up the lesson using a story that's not necessarily based on strictly the way things happen. Uh, but I won't go into that right now. All I can say is I would not be certain that such a man is in hell. 
Now, you said he tried to study the Bible. I don't know what that means. I don't know if he had a commitment to Christ or if he was just curious about Christianity or, or what? Oh, no, he was, uh, he, he reached out to, um, I guess it's IOC, International Church of Christ, and they, he, he tried to do brotherhood and fellowship, but it, it, was, it just didn't work out because he was, um, in terms of transportation and whatnot, so he wasn't able to make it to the groups. Um, but he was very interested in trying to learn as much as he can um, in reference to the Bible, but it just, in terms of logistics, and in terms of the poverty and, and the, the distance, it, it just wasn't possible, but he yeah. tried his best. Well, you know, there are there's a certain kind of evangelical uh, that would say, you know, he never stepped across the line, never said the sinner's prayer, never was baptized, never got, you know, converted or whatever, and would say, you know, there's no hope for him. Uh, I am back. Uh, this has happened twice this week. My my equipment, which connects to the studio, apparently uh, went on the fritz. Maybe I have to replace the equipment. I hope not. It's expensive. But uh, I don't want this to keep happening. Uh, then I don't know when my voice, uh, live voice, went off. But I was talking to our previous caller. And uh, one thing I wanted to say to him, since he was asking about suicide, just yesterday, the first call on our program yesterday, was about suicide, and I talked about it at some length. So I wanted to recommend if somebody wants uh, me to talk longer than I did just now about the subject, you can go to yesterday's program at our website, thenarrowpath.com. Just go to the radio archives, and there's a calendar has every day of the month on it, and just click yesterday's program, listen to the first, uh, the first call, and I did cover some this subject in considerably more uh, detail. Lou, are you gone? Are you there? Okay, Lou is gone. Let's talk next to um, Nick from Salt Lake City, Utah. Nick, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for call- calling. Hello? Hello. Yeah, hi, Steve. How are you? Good. Uh, my question is, uh, in, in Genesis, in the beginning, there's it's like there's three gods. And some people go, well, that's a trinity, because there's a god, there's a lord god, and there's a lord. Why do they have? Why do they delineate it like that? Do you, do you have any idea? Well, why why would you assume those are three gods? Uh, I wouldn't. Well, um, why didn't he just call him God all throughout creation? Why did he have and Lord God? I mean, why would you change? Why would the writer change that from God to Lord God to at times Lord? I I don't know why he would use three different names. Well, I'm not I'm not really sure why I'm not sure why different terms are used. You know, in speaking to Simon Peter, Jesus sometimes called him Peter, sometimes called him Simon, and sometimes he's called Simon Peter. I mean, if somebody is is sometimes addressed in different ways, uh, a person can address them in any of those ways or in a combination of those ways. Um, you know, I, I've I've read Genesis all my life, and I've never seen any suggestion there that God or Yahweh or or Yahweh God are are not the, all references the same God. God, in this case, is Elohim. Lord is Yahweh. And putting them together would be Yahweh Elohim. Uh, they're just, I mean, they are different. Uh, they're, they're different uh, ways of speaking. But in the Bible, Elohim and Yahweh are the same God. So it's just, you know, using different titles for him and combining them in different ways, uh, very possibly to avoid uh you know, boring repetition of this of just using the same thing, the same designation all the time, because he is known by lots of designations in Scripture. Uh, is is Moses supposedly the author of Genesis? Yes. And uh, in the early manuscripts, does it delineate each different god like that, or did he? Or was that? You know, I'm, I guess I'm wondering how he comes about that. It just seems like if I'm talking about God, I don't want anybody to know. I don't want anybody to think that I'm talking about anybody other than God. Well, God. you know, Christians have read Genesis the way it is for centuries, and I don't think one in a million has come up with the idea that it's talking about several different gods. I mean, there 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 may have been someone besides yourself who has come to that conclusion, but it's not the it's not the most intuitive way to look at it. I think that it's there's always one God in the Book of Genesis, and if he's called Yahweh or he's called Elohim or he's called Elohim Yahweh or if he's called Adonai. Um, or, or whatever. I mean, he's called by lots of different titles, but 
I don't, I don't know that Moses would have to explain why. If he would, I, I can't do it for him. But so you, you don't know, think he was talking to different portions of the Godhead? Not you necessarily. Know? No, I don't think so. Okay. I, I don't know. To me, it was, you know, the first three, when God's creating, God created, God created, it's God. And then there are times when it says, and the Lord God, and, and the Lord is not, you know, heir to uh, Yeah, well, you'll find that all the way through the Bible, not just in the creation story. You'll find that God is sometimes called Lord God, Yahweh Elohim. Sometimes he's just okay. called Yahweh. Sometimes he's just called Elohim. Sometimes he's called Adonai. And uh, sometimes, once he's called El El Yang. And, uh, and, and, uh, Different different titles like that are used for God, but there's there's only one real God, and so whenever it's talking about the real God, it's always talking about the same one. Okay, so he wasn't actually actually talking about the different, you know, Trinity different of of the Godhead. He was just still talking about God. He just used a different name, in your opinion. Well, I would say yeah, I would say uh, from what you can deduce from the usage of those words, you'd have no reason to believe he's talking about the Trinity. I mean, there are people who think the Trinity is in view here because uh, God says, let us make man in our image, and there's a plural used there, or even that the word Elohim itself is a plural noun, but is used as a singular noun in the sentences because it uses um, a verb form that goes with a singular subject. I mean, there are, elements, there are elements in the passage that have caused Christians to read back into it uh, the Trinity that we believe in from the New Testament. But it, there's nothing in the passage that a Hebrew Jewish person reading in the original language would say, oh, that's got to be a Trinity. Uh, they would have other ways of seeing it. But but certainly calling God Elohim or Yahweh Elohim is not going doesn't mean there's two different persons necessarily in, indicated by those terms. And you actually brought up my next question when he says, let us make man in our image. Uh -huh. So the us is... I guess we're referring to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or we don't really well, know. Well, possibly, what, what possibly. Yeah, I mean, we're not really sure. I mean, there's different ways that it could be seen. Well, that is one of the ways that it is seen. There are some people think that God's using what we might call the editorial we, uh, or the we of majesty, uh, when he's really just speaking about himself, to speak himself in the plural because he's not, because he's, I don't know, just more magnificent than just one person usually. Would be, but I, you know, there's there's no answer that's uh, that's universally agreed upon. But you know, if a person wished to see that as a reference to the Trinity, I I wouldn't object, because I believe in the Trinity, uh, and so I wouldn't have any problem with that being the correct answer. Uh, there are people who think he's referring to the heavenly council that is with him when he creates, um, and that he's Meaning referring to. Yeah, well, the angels, or I mean, there's a whole there's a whole. Uh, a sector out there of evangelical world that that believes that there was a divine council made up of gods, lesser gods than Yahweh, but I don't. I, I'm not seeing it that way. The, I think the scriptures they use to make that point are not persuasive to me. I think it'd be more like the council of the angels, but um, I, I don't have a, a, a firm view about why he says we. You know, I knew I heard a rabbi said. Of course, he's not, not coming from a Christian point of view. He said that when God said, let us make man in our image, he's talking about the animals because man is slightly in the image of animals and slightly in the image of God. And that if it, it, I guess the rabbi believed in evolution, so he figured the animal world had its role in producing man, creating man through evolution. And then God put in his spirit, so, the, so man is made in the image of both, God uh, and of the image of animals. I don't accept that, though, because the we is used in other ways that that can't work. For example, um, in chapter 11, when he says in the Tower of Babel, let us go down and see this thing which man has made. Well, he's not going to talk to the animals that way, like the animals have to go down from heaven to see. So right. there's, you know, it doesn't, that's never explained in the Bible, but there's several different possible explanations that Christians have adopted. Any of them work for me, and I'm not, I'm not, uh, you know, so, so much of a disposition that I have to nail one down especially when the evidence is not absolutely persuasive for one view over another. So it's one of those things that I don't mind having no certainty about. You've kind of thrown another curveball at me when you said they, there's some that believe there's a council of lesser gods. I've never thought of there being any lesser gods. They're just God. Well, Michael I, Heiser has made that view pretty popular in his book, The Unseen Realm. Um, 
I don't, uh, you know, I'm not, I don't follow his teaching uh, that much, but I mean, he's, he's got some points uh, worthy of consideration. But uh, I think that what he's calling lesser gods is just what we would normally call the angels. Yeah, I've always thought the heavenly hosts were angels, other yeah. created beings. That's, uh, that's my view also, yeah. Okay. All right, thank you, Steve. Okay, I appreciate your call, Nick. God bless you. Ray from Covington, Washington. Welcome to The Narrow Path. Hi, Ray. Hello. Hi. Are you there, Ray? Yes, I'm right here. Go ahead. Okay, um, I got a rather unique way of handling uh, doctrinal issues. Instead of like debating, because I hate debating, it, it pits two people against each other, and I would rather manifest the spirit of um, of God's word and God's will and His way. In other words, to be kind and gracious. Um, the Trinity thing. Uh, after 35 years of looking into this. Deeply, I have found not only a reason, but good reason, to doubt the um, doctrine of the Trinity. What I'm going to present to you is just simply reasons. I'm not going to debate you. I hope you give me time to do it. I'm simply going to give you some reasons. I'm going to run them down real quick. Here I go. Go ahead. Number one. Number one, we all know there's no such word in the Bible as Trinity. Number two, every single Trinitarian term is completely absent from the Bible. Number three, those terms emerged um, from... 300 plus years after the Bible was finished, or in post apostolic times. Number four, historically, the Roman Catholic Church, in its infancy, is where we see the original underpinnings of this doctrine and its terminology. Number five, nobody can seem to define person or persons when I ask. Um, try to um, find or use or substitute another word for person or persons to try to at least shed a little more light on this doctrine. Number six, the Bible says God is one, not God is three. And I understand the context of Deuteronomy 6, 4, and Jesus Christ's confirmation thereof in Mark 12, 29. Mark 12, 29 is saying two things. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God. Stop right there. Lord your God is saying the one God. And then it goes on to say, he, that one God, is one. God should have said, I am three, or we are one, but he did not. Number seven, the Father is the Father and the Son is the Son. Only one can be God. Number eight, the Trinity definitely states on numerous occasions, I'm sorry, the New Testament definitely states on numerous occasions that the Father is God and God is the Father. In 1 John chapter 4 alone, God the Father is mentioned 40 times, that's 4 times 10, whereas Jesus or Jesus Christ is mentioned only 9 times, and the context is always as the Son of God. I know for a fact that Son of God is not the same as God. The word God means God, and the word Son of God means Son of God. They're not the same. Only one can be God. Number nine, Jesus was born. God wasn't. Jesus was a baby. God wasn't. Jesus even had to grow in wisdom and stature. If he's God, why would he do that? God is omniscient. He already knows. Jesus had to learn obedience. God does not. He's omniscient. Jesus sweat blood mixed with tears because he was so afraid at Gethsemane, and he prayed fervently to the Father. Notice, Christ prayed to the Father. God does not pray to God. Number 14, Jesus Ask God to take this cup from him. Fifteen. Jesus tried out. Dog, dog, dog. Ray, how many? Ray, how many of these are there? Because we're near the end of the program. Uh, well, there's, I got fifty of them. <laughs> fifty. Well, um, let's stop. Let's stop with fifteen. Okay, give me the number fifteen. Okay. He said at Golgotha, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Why have you, God, forsaken me? Why has God forsaken God? It doesn't make yeah. sense. Okay. And what I've given you so far is only a, a tip of the iceberg of what I could give you if I had time. Yeah, and if all the if all the arguments are the same as these, or that is uh, of the same quality, they get us nowhere. Um, but I can appreciate the fact that you're searching the scriptures and tra- trying to reach your own conclusions about things. I think people ought to do so. Uh, but I think you're mistaken if you think that those uh, arguments would be lost on people who are convinced Trinitarians. For example, I'm I'm a a, a convinced Trinitarian. Uh, not because not because of the Nicene Council or any of the other councils or creeds. I'm, I'm convinced of Trinitarianism because I read the Bible, including those same points you make. Your concern is with the statement that Jesus is God. I think the Bible would be uh, would want to put a finer point on it. A, a Trinitarian believes Jesus is God who has become man. That is, he is God manifest in a human being. And that human being is called the Son of God. And yes, as in his human form, he is subject to his Father. He is subject to God in a different way. But 
you know, uh, although God is one, you read throughout the Bible of the word of the Lord. Well, the New Testament indicates that the word of the Lord is God and is with God, according to John 1.1. 1, 1. So uh, you do have the word spoken of in the Old Testament. You have the spirit of the Lord in the Old Testament, too. Now, you're right. The term persons and substance and trinity and so forth are not found in the Bible. These are theological terms that uh, that were brought in to try to, you know, encapsulate larger principles. And, uh, you know, if you don't like the terms, you don't have to. I, it's not as important what terms we use as it is that we know God as he is. Uh, to say that the Roman Catholic Church was uh, it was responsible for this doctrine is quite a mistake. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church didn't exist until about, about 600 AD. Uh, the church developed eventually over the centuries into what we call the Roman Catholic Church in the West, not in the East. But uh, the church hasn't always, there was, never was a time when all the church was Roman Catholic. But all the church has always been, uh, at least, you know, until, well, after a certain point, the entire church, even that which had nothing to do with Roman Catholicism, has been Trinitarian. Uh, but, I mean, the, the whole idea here is uh, you're, you're laboring to harmonize certain concepts that you find not easily harmonized. And Trinitarians don't have the same difficulty harmonizing them. To say the Son of God is not God, uh, that's one of your arguments. Well, I mean, you know, anyone can see the reasonableness of that s statement. Then you would have to say, well, then why would any thinking person ever be a Trinitarian? Well, it'd be good to find out because the Trinitarian apparently understands the reality in such a way so that the Son of God is, in fact, God, in a sense. Uh, you say that the Bible says God is one. Well, the Bible says a husband and wife are one also. You say it doesn't say he's three. Well, I don't know if the Bible necessarily will emphasize that husband and wife are two, but they are, and they are one. Um, there's just an awful lot in the way you're you're arguing. I realize you're you're hurting for time, and we're we're all we're hurting for time right here on the show. We're going to have to uh, close it up. But uh, yeah, I didn't have time for fifty of your reasons, but I hope you don't mind. I gave you more time I'd give most people uh, because I did want you to give you know, as much of a case as you could. Uh, if, if the 50 reasons you have are of the same weight and quality as the 15 you gave, uh, then I'm, I remain unconvinced. But I can see why you're having a trouble with the Trinity. And I'm not, you know, I'm not going to debate you about it necessarily because I don't think that being saved is directly related to an understanding of the Trinity. I think being saved is, has to do with following Jesus Christ. And uh, we probably agree about that. All right. I, I do appreciate your call, though. And uh, I certainly gave you a lot of time to, to share a lot of those reasons. Uh, we're just about out of time here. I would like to take another call, but I, I'm afraid I'm going to just short shift you. Uh, that'd be Marvin from Waco, Texas. Let me give you a minute if you want it. If you don't want it, you can call back tomorrow. Uh, Marvin, welcome to the narrow path. Can you use 30 yes, seconds, sir? I'm here. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, sir. I just have a quick question for you. I'd just like to know what the Bible may say about burial as opposed to cremation. And I'll hang up and let you uh, go sure. ahead and, and close out with that. All right. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you for your question. Uh, the Bible doesn't ever speak of cremation as a deliberate way of disposing of a body. And in the Bible, people always were generally buried uh, if they were honorably viewed after their death. Sometimes people were not buried because of scorn that was being heaped upon them. They were left out for the dogs or the vultures to eat, or they were hung up on a post, or they were even burned to ashes. And these were different ways that scoundrels were sometimes dishonored after their death. Uh, everyone in, the old, in biblical times wanted to be buried, and they would not generally choose to be cremated. And because of that, there are some Christians who think that cremation would be morally wrong or objectionable to God. Well, I don't reach that conclusion from that information. Culturally, it was very important to them to be buried. But there's nothing in the Bible that says it's immoral to have your body disposed of some other way. I mean, what happens to Christians who died burned at the stake? They were cremated alive. Now they're ashes. You know, they didn't get a regular burial. Or people who died in flaming, you know, accidents, uh, or whatever. There's there's lots of people whose bodies are not intact to be buried afterwards. And if, if somehow 
God requires your body to be intact and buried, then these people are out of luck, even though they are faithful to God, even unto death. I, I think that what happens to the body after death is a non-issue for God, though it is an issue for some people. And because of that, uh, many people, especially religious people, often want to be buried rather than cremated, though that's not as universally uh, felt among Christians as it once was. I don't think it's an issue with God. The Bible does not make an issue of it. You've been listening to the Narrow Path radio broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg. We are listener supported. If you'd like to help us stay on the air, you can write to the Narrow Path, P.O. Box 1730, Temecula, California, 92593. Or go to our website, thenarrowpath.com. Thanks for joining us. Let's talk again tomorrow. God bless you.